in the SCA. I am Alexandre Laurel Davigné, or Davignon, depending on to whom you are speaking and about what time you met me. And in the rest of the world, I am uh, Jeff Berry. Uh, <clears throat> I could probably get you very, very close, but it will have been 37 years next February or maybe 38. So, more than 35, but not quite 40. I was made a Master of the Pelican and a Master of the Laurel in the East Kingdom. I am the premier white scarf of the Kingdom of the Outlands, which means, for those who keep track of such things, I was the first white scarf to be made outside of the Kingdom of Anstiora. And then in Drakenwald, uh, I was made a Master of the Order of Defense, and I served as Prince of Insulae Draconis, and am therefore also a Viscount. The Order of the Laurel is one of the great orders of peerage, equal in all ways in rank and status to the other great orders of peerage, the Pelican, the Defense, and the Order of Chivalry. And the Laurel is the order which is there to recognize uh, excellence in the arts and sciences, not only in the practice, but also in teaching and support of the arts and sciences, as they are broadly understood within the society. I like to say that I was a cooking laurel with a side order of poetry. Um, as, I, as I understand it, and this is all, of course, hearsay, was that there was some debate when I was being discussed as to what precisely <laughs> my, my laurel should be in. Uh, cookery, I think, is, is the right answer. I've been doing cookery in the society for nearly as long as I've been in the society. But I have also done some extensive poetical works in the, in the SCA. Um, not just sort of standalone poetry, but I've written some verse plays, uh, one, a mumming for a coronation in the East Kingdom, which was, which was good fun, so. I've been cooking since I was very young, uh, single digits of years. My parents supported me and taught me in cooking. So it seemed a, a natural enough thing to do when I got involved in the SCA. And the group of people that I really connected with in the SCA when I got started in my mid-teens were known for the quality of their, their cookery. It's the uh, St. Mary's Abbey in the, in the Kingdom of the Outlands. It was well known for food, not, not just at feasts, but also camp cookery and so on. So it was very natural for, natural for me to start doing the cookery with them in the, you know, the mid-80s when I was getting started in the SCA. And I was doing feasts in the, in the kingdom by, by the mid to late 80s, including a couple of the Keratin Twelfth Night, which was one of the two biggest events regularly held in the kingdom, and one of the biggest indoor feast events. The cheese making came, came much later, actually. So the process really is, for me at least, was the more I got involved in the cookery, and as more and more resources became available to me and to the world at large, um, that the idea of figuring out not just how to get the, the recipe onto the table, the last step in the process, but so much more of what was going on before and underneath the processes. The stuff that we, in the modern world, so often take for granted. Um, you know, bread making. A lot of people make bread. But not everybody makes bread, and especially growing up, 
regular bread making was not a feature in most households that I'm aware of. And even in the Middle Ages, the, the correct solution in many cases is hire a specialist to do it. I mean, most times in the Middle Ages, you bought your bread from the baker. That, that's what you did. But the engineer in me wanted to also know that under process, so the bread. Uh, same thing with the meat, with curing meat. You know, we're used to just going and buying our, our bacons and our hams and our charcuterie and our salome, which is great. In, in the Middle Ages, much of the time, the correct solution would be you go to the specialist who does that and you get it. But if you were the head cook of a, of a large household, then you are, if not hands-on with that stuff, you are responsible for all that stuff that's going on. So if you are running a king's household or a baronial household, then you are responsible for making sure that the bacon gets made and that somebody is making cheese and that if there's a bread oven on site that the bakers are doing their job. So it, it's all part and parcel for me of understanding what it meant to be a medieval cook in a larger sense as well as the smaller sense. The cheese making, uh, what probably, and I think that I think I can remember this happening, what really drove it and what kicked it off would have been in the early 2000s when I was living in New York City and I was walking home from work one day and they were, were starting to set up a little mini, mini market, just half a dozen stalls maybe, on Broadway up by Columbia University, which I walked past on my way to work. And so I, so I was walking to work and somebody was setting up some dairy there on the table from, from a little farm upstate and had the non-homogenized milk. And I can almost visualize myself saying to my wife, ah, they've got non-homogenized milk? I should make cheese! And even if I didn't say it, that's probably what kicked it off, in my head at least, was suddenly there was a source there for something which would, presumably, give me good results for cheese making. And I never looked back. And as long as we were living in New York, I would stop by that little market on my way home from work pretty much every week on a Thursday and pick up a couple of pints of milk or a couple of pints of milk and a pint of cream or something like that, depending on what I was experimenting with or felt like, and roll the cheese over. So for a while there, I was making a batch of cheese, not a big batch, um, about half the size of the batch that we're making for this for this film. Um, but I was making it pretty much every week and just constantly rolling it over. Um, that's really kind of, I think, what kicked it off was probably that serendipitous discovery of a source for the raw materials. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly what I find so satisfying about it. Some of it really is just that sense of making something out of disparate elements. It's the create, you know, there's a creative aspect to it. It's like cookery or presumably other creative arts that I don't do very well. But there's that element of taking something and turning it into something else. I mean, and cheese making is even more than things like meat curing or, or even bread making, really does seem almost magical because you take this liquid stuff and then what comes out of the other end is something that you can grate over your pasta. So it's just kind of fun. And, and there is also, and this is something which I think comes into play for myself and for a lot of people, about cookery in general and cheese making in particular, is it's, it's a little something, a little thing over which you have the control. Once you get the items in place, the success or failure of that really is not dependent on anyone else. 
You know, if, if you do what you're supposed to do and you have the things that you're supposed to do it with, it should work. It doesn't sometimes, which is incredibly frustrating, but that's a thing. And the other thing that I kind of like about it is that it's got so much scope for individual variation, individual interpretation. Um, I usually make two kinds of cheese because those are kinds of cheese that I like and I've got a process that works for it. But within the last six or eight months, I've made at least one or two other kinds of cheese. No, at least two. Now, one I've made with chives and I made one with garlic. Uh, I don't remember why I decided to do the garlic one, but the chives one was because we were growing chives and we had a lot of chives and I needed something to do with the chives. So instead of just making a plain cheese, I cut up a bunch of chives, got that in there at the right stage of the process, and made a chive cheese, which was good fun. And partly I just like knowing how stuff works. I just like knowing what the process is. And if you know, if you know how cheese is made, even if you never do it, you have a greater sort of appreciation and understanding of what's gone into that slab of cheddar that you picked up at the market.